growth year, okay? So Adam, personally too, to give you guys an idea, not only does he lead a massive board, but he still sells from the front. So he leads from the front, he gets out there. Last year, still put in 100 deals, and that's so rare for a senior regional to still get out there and sell with guys. He took me on the doors. Normally, it'd be like, hey, someone else, go take this guy out. So he leads from the front and he crushes the game. Okay, so first, Adam, just to kind of dive into it, 13 years ago, where'd you start? What's your background? Man, so for all the Idaho farmers out there, I grew up in Idaho on a farm. Um, wasn't a born salesman, my dad. Uh, you know, taught us a little bit about, uh, you know, farming and sales, you know, as on the farm. But honestly, I, before I went to school and that kind of stuff, all I had was farming and I had a good work ethic and I had sports and I knew if I wanted to get out of Idaho and get anywhere, I needed sports to take me there. So went to Utah to play some college baseball and quickly realized that I was in a different element and different world. I saw young guys driving sports cars and Escalades and different things. And I realized that these guys weren't doctors, they weren't lawyers, but I was very aware. I was very aware of young individuals making good money and I was attracted to it for whatever reason. It, it just struck a chord for me. And so I was always on the, on the lookout on trying to get in with these guys and figure out who these guys were. Um, I took a position at a call center, um, you know, about my, my, my second year in college and I hated it, hated my job. And I kept seeing these guys making good money and I just, I didn't know how they were doing it. And one day somebody came up to me and said, do you want to get into sales? And he was one of these guys. He was driving a BMW N5 and I was like, this is the guy, this is the guy I wanted to be, you know, get to know. And he introduced me to the world of, of sales and it happened to be door to door sales. So, Dang, dude. Okay. you know, I wasn't scared. I was, I was ready to embrace the opportunity. They told me I was moving out to Colorado, which I've never been to before. And I got out and I remembered them giving me a training manual and telling me what was required. And I just wanted to go 10 times harder than what was required. And my very first year I made $60,000 my first summer. Um, you know, my dad couldn't believe it. My brothers couldn't believe it that I made that kind of money. My friends couldn't believe it. Um, it just completely, it gave me a, a paradigm shift on like how the world operates. And I was attracted to this platform, right? Of sales. Mm -hmm. I've always had farming. I've always had baseball sports, something to keep me competitive and work really hard. The call center just didn't feed that and the job and sales was finally a platform that i could see how good i could be at something and it was a I, challenge it was a challenge yeah. and i could compete against guys that were equal to me at first and then i could take down the vets and then i was hunting for the manager i wanted to take mm -hmm. down the manager as a rookie as a rookie like That's that was, that was yeah. my inspiration and sales gave me that platform right it gave me something to see how good i could become which I missed with baseball and I needed that in my life. And immediately I was just kind of obsessed with sales and progression. Nice. So just to kind of recap, got into sales cause he liked the nice stuff. He liked all the, like the cool things he saw the sales guys have that they could do with their lives. Got into the game. Not only did he want to be in the game, but he wanted to be the best in the game from the very beginning. Okay. So a lot of people reached out on my Instagram too and they asked, about what his rookie year looked like. So what did it look like to actually learn to sell? Obviously he did pretty well, but I would imagine that wasn't just like a walk in the park you had to learn, right? No, like sales was a foreign concept to me. I remember when I got the call center job, the interview was with a friend I knew, a person mm -hmm. that I knew. And I remember in the in-person the in the in -person interview, I was like sweating. I was nervous, nervous. to talk about yeah. myself. I did not know how to conduct myself in, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So sales was very foreign to me. Communication was foreign to me. The power of influence was foreign to me. And uh, communication skills, all these different things was foreign to me. And so when I got the training manual, which is all we had back in the day, we didn't have mm -hmm. videos. Paper, all paper. Yes, yeah. and I, uh, that, was a, that was a good introduction, but then I realized I needed to read sales books. Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins, whatever I could get my hands on, I was reading sales books mm. to understand the psychology behind selling and the right terminology to use, how to close, how to transition. And so again, it was just like baseball to me. It was a challenge. It was learning a foreign language to me and, and I was ready for it.
Nice. So I think there's kind of two types of guys that come into sales. You got the Adam that's like, give me a book, give me a manual, give me everything I want to learn. I want to get great. And you got the guy that says, I don't know what to do next. Like what's next? I don't know. Like what do I study? So kind of give you guys an idea. Maybe Adam can give us his top three books. Yeah. From back then that can just help you get really good at sales no matter where you're at. Yeah. The three books that really kind of changed the way I thought. Number one, the first book I ever read was Psychology of Selling. Um, that book really just helped me understand sales. Second book I recommend to everybody is The, uh, the Art of Closing the Sale, mm -hmm. Zig Ziglar book, okay? Classic. Absolute classic, just learning sales and that kind of stuff. And then the third book I would probably say How to Win Friends and Influence People. Sweet. Being likable immediately, how to, communication, how to communicate with people to make them like you so that you're not bugging people on the doors or feeling like you're a burden to somebody when you first start and talking to them, you can make people like you immediately yeah. if you understand the power of influence. Absolutely. Um, I think if I have to put a fourth book on that list um, would be 10X, Grant Cardone 10X. Oh, like sure. That one really changed my mindset on getting out of the middle class mindset. Um, and if I put a fifth book on there, it's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah, five <laughs> books going, guys. So Rich, Rich Dad, down. Poor Dad. These books just like literally changed the way I thought about life and income and opportunity. Yeah, awesome. Guys, if you're just jumping on, there's a lot of people jumping on and off. We're talking about Adam Nelson, who's been in the sales game 13 years, running a massive region of 10,000 accounts this last year, going to 12 to 13,000 accounts, okay? And we just got done talking about some top books for him to read. So that being said, if you want to get really good at something, typically you always hear this said, like get a good mentor. When you got into sales, who mentored you? How'd you get good? Dude, I had good mentors, like looking at it right now. I don't know if they're on here. They're probably going to see this. I had Casey Baugh, Nick Hansen, Jeff Mendez, Cheyenne Thatcher, Dave Allred, like multi-millionaires, right? These guys, I forced myself into a culture, into an organization of guys making millions of dollars and Todd Peterson, obviously yeah. now billionaires. These are people that have been around for 13 years. And when you put yourself in this circle of influence, when you force yourself into that circle, the conversations are very different. You know, um, when you're golfing, you're talking a very different conversation about, uh, you know, creating income and saving on your taxes and investing in real estate yeah. and what books are you reading and betting hundreds instead of ones, Bet <laughs> a lot of, some gambling going yeah, on there. Yeah. Okay. It's a very different circle and I was not used to that and I loved it, you know? So, um, obviously I probably forgot a bunch of people, but I had some awesome mentors to, to just kind of watch from, from behind the scene and kind of emulate everything that they were doing. Whatever they were doing in investing, whatever they're doing with taxes, whatever they're setting as their financial goals, I knew I was just a few years behind them, that I mm -hmm. could get there in four or five years if I just followed their example. Dang. Shout That's out sweet. shout out to those guys if they watch this. Shout out to those guys. Hey, so like keep that in mind, mentors matter, right? So you're looking for people that just know more than you. They don't have to be Millionaires yet, you need to find someone that knows how to make a hundred thousand. Let them be their men your mentor at the beginning. We try to jump so fast into like massive mentors that aren't even gonna spend time on us yet, where you have mentors around you that are ready to help you make a hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand and up. Okay, get yourself around those people so you can crush the game. So that being said, beyond your mentors, um, as you got into Vivint, what did your income look like as it started to grow? Um, so first year made 60 grand. That's above average, right? Just, mm -hmm. just barely above today's average. Um, that was exciting. That paid off school. Yeah. Um, after that, I set a goal that I wanted to, I bought a new car. Okay. Uh, after that, I set a goal that I wanted to buy a townhome. I wanted to get into real estate. Sweet. And, uh, I went and met with a loan officer and they were like, you can't qualify for a house. You have one year of income. You need to show at least two years of income. So. Uh, I set a goal to make a hundred grand, came up just short of that, made about 92 grand my second, second summer. second year? Mm -hmm. Dang. And then my third summer, I was running my own team. Uh, now I'm a senior in, in college. Uh, I was clearing 200,000 um, as a senior in college. So when I graduated, it was no longer of, is this just a good summer sales opportunity? Me and my wife, we got married my senior year. We had opportunities to get into real estate, to get into insurance sales, and at that point, uh, I looked at Vivint in a different limelight. I looked at it as a career opportunity and a suit and tie type job. Like what if I 
dedicated 50 weeks a year, 40 hours a week to this job, what could it look like? If I'm making this yeah. kind of money in college, in the summer, in the summer, yeah. what if I treated this like a year round opportunity? And I set a five year goal with Cheyenne, with my, with my boss. I said five years or bust, regional manager or bust for me. Mm -hmm. Like this is what I want to hit. This is where I want to get to. And I think law of attraction just happened. You start putting those things, those thoughts into the universe and it happens. And uh, five years we hit regional manager, you know, four, four years we hit regional manager okay. after that. Yeah. And so uh, what's really cool is there, there's a video out there of me floating around. 10 years in a row, I increased my income by over $30,000, which is just, it's a blessing, but it's, uh, again, it's this platform that you can challenge yourself and find ways to improve, whether it's in personal sales, recruiting, retention, team building, better culture, whatever it is, you can find a way to make more money and not need to wait for the promotion or you don't need to wait for the bonus, you know, it's just, okay, this is what I did last year. How can I improve and go and tackle it and get better yeah. every year? Sweet. So kind of two takeaways for me on that. First off, if you did the math, he increased his income by 30,000 over 10 years. So he increased his income by 300,000 over a 10 year period. Okay, that's pretty massive. Second thing I took away from that is I end up talking to a lot of guys that like they're excited about all these different income streams. I talk to people about it all the time. If you didn't listen to this just now, what did he do? One, he got a bunch of money in one income stream. And now we're gonna dive into some other income streams that so many guys get distracted by like, I wanna have multiple streams of income. They become average at those streams and they never really crush the game in one thing. And that sounds like you got to crush the game first. Yeah, it's the quote, you can be the jack of all trades, master of none, Yeah. right? Like you don't wanna be that guy and dabbling in everything. For me, I needed to, I understood Grant Cardone, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I needed to establish my own business first. Mm -hmm. I needed to earn professional income so that I could be a real investor, not a dabbler, right? I didn't wanna just dabble in, in investing 500 bucks here a thousand dollars there you're not going to get a lot done with that yeah i wanted to max out my iras i wanted to get into the real estate game and so i, I realized that requires professional income right and right. and so i figured out my one source of income was going to be vivid this is my vehicle um you know sales uh this is my vehicle to earn high income then i can become a professional investor so, so you don't leave your vehicle don't leave your vehicle. Yeah, no. so guys, you get, get in a vehicle that's your main vehicle, keep your vehicle, and let your vehicle flow into other things rather than trying to jump into other things. He could have gotten into real estate. He probably could have gotten into another sales job. He probably could have gotten into a corporate job at some point, but he knew his vehicle and then he said, okay, now I'm gonna take this vehicle and I'm gonna start dumping my vehicle money into other things now that my vehicle makes me professional money. Yeah, right? and I feel like too many people change vehicles every two to three years. I think that's the average statistic of people changing their careers. Mm. Like the 10,000 hour rule, right? Outliers, book outliers. You, you cannot become an expert in your industry or your field without putting in at least 10,000 hours. So you're not even scratching the surface of your potential until you've done 10,000 hours in that industry. That's five years, right? Five, uh, year, five years, five years working full time. Full time, yeah. 40 hours a week. So for me in college, no, I probably hadn't even put in that much time yet. I probably put in half that time. And then it probably took me a couple years after that to hit my 5,000 hours or 10,000 hours. Yeah. Probably realistically seven, eight years before I was an expert in my field, right? And a lot of my friends have changed industries four times before that. And, and where and what are they doing now? They, they haven't become experts in their fields yet, right? They never become experts. Correct, yet. right? They're just chasing the next best thing, or instead of watering, or, or you know, imagining the grass is greener on the side, just water where your grass is already growing and gets better, better, you know, yeah. make it greener. 100%, so kind of some takeaways from that, right? Make sure you get in a vehicle, stay in your vehicle, and then you start pushing your money out from that vehicle, right? Um, and then a huge takeaway for me, just listening to what he's saying is, he started in sales knowing he wanted like all the good things in life right? You don't need to like want all the good things in life, I don't think. But I think you need a vision of like what you really want, because then he was able to say, hey, I got to go five years to regional or I'm done. So he, he basically gave himself an ultimatum. By setting a goal like that, he then upped his work, right? I yeah. mean, you don't just set a goal and then just be like, well, I hope I get there. Like, let's see if we can pull it off. You go to work, right? What did that look like going to work to build 
or region over five years? Um, my intent and purpose changed. My meetings changed. The books I was reading changed. Everything changed in my actions, right? Yeah. Um, when I was recruiting, I was no longer recruiting sales guys to come out with me for one summer. I was recruiting for five years down the road. Like year one, you're a sales rep. I'm gonna get you to make 50 to 75 grand. Year two, you're an assistant manager. Year three, you're running your own team, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the first meeting. So I'm recruiting managers in the very first meeting. I'm not just uh, recruiting, hey, come out with me this summer, right? So my vision is their vision. And I'm trying to give them the vision of, I'm here for the long run. I need you to build with me long-term, right? And so yeah. that way, when they go home and tell their girlfriend or their mom or their wife, they knew that I had a vision for them. They knew I had a plan for them that was three, five years down the road for them, you know? Sweet. Yeah, so if you don't have a, a good vision, it's really hard to know like what you're even aiming at, right? And so go to work on your vision so you can really get to where you wanna go. And even, even if you're not in door-to-door -door sales, everybody has to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, Tony Robbins talks about this, if you don't have a plan, you are literally floating through life and you're gonna wake up five years down the road and not know how you got there. You're overweight, yeah. you're working a job you hate, you're, you're living in a place you don't wanna live, you know, you, you just, you're going as the, the river takes you instead of having purpose and intent of where you want to go, having a roadmap, you know, anybody that has a plan and the right effort, you know, put into it, they're going to always end up where they, you know, want to go. Or, so, or barely short and take a little bit longer to get there. Right. right? Yeah. It's, especially if you keep plugging through it. Right. Yeah, and I think the worst thing is that you get to a certain point if you don't have a plan and you don't like who you are. Yeah. And that's because you've been planning, you've been floating, you let everything outside of you influence you to go wherever and you're not actually like getting dialed in with what you want and creating yourself, you're letting everyone create you. Yep, dial it in, get a five year plan. No, no matter what industry you're in, have a plan and make sure if you're setting a big goal, right? You gotta understand there's gotta be equally the same size of sacrifice to mm -hmm. achieve that goal, right? So for me, setting a plan to become a regional like I knew there were sacrifices that needed to be had, which is training my guys, extra recruiting time, extra time on the doors, extra preseason accounts, mm. extra sales in the summer, right? Right. Whatever it was, it was a bigger goal, which requires bigger sacrifices. So you can't have a big goal and a little sacrifice. It, it just won't ever happen. So you gotta understand, I'm setting this big goal to build this home or to, to create this lifestyle. There are sacrifices that you are signing up for when you set that type of goal. Yeah. 100%. Awesome. So next, I want to dive in a little bit. Um, I think a lot of people talk about wanting to get into real estate. We've touched on it a little bit, but I want to talk to him a little bit about like what that looks like, because I think most of us, when it's like, dude, I'm going to go buy all these properties. We're like, where do I start? How do I start buying real estate? How do I even get into that? How, how would you say, if you, how do you get into real estate? I'm not, I'm not owning a house, but investing in no, real estate. No, that's probably the top question I get. Obviously, I do a lot of uh, real estate TikToks and Instagram videos on here. Um, but for my first, you know, five, six years, I always just dabbled in real estate. I didn't ever get serious about it. Mm. I was always, uh, the very first house I bought, right, I understood how to build credit. So at the age of 18, I went and got a credit card from my bank, right? It was a $500 limit. It was a student credit card. So uh, somebody wrote on here, how do I get build credit, right? So yeah. go get a student credit card or um, you know, a, line, a secured line of credit where you give the bank cash and they'll give you a line of credit for that same amount and you can use, use your credit card. Okay? Not because you need the money though, right? It's the build, build credit. Just to use it, pay it off. Yep, you gotta build your credit history, okay? So if you don't have credit history, you gotta build it. Then you gotta get your income and your taxes in order, right? Sorry guys, got a phone call. Nick Toker calling right in the middle um, of this. So you gotta get your taxes and in, in income in order, yeah. which I met with a loan officer and I understood what that looked like to buy my first property mm. at the age of 21, okay? Mm. Um, and so at 21 years old, I had my credit established for three or four years now, I had my taxes in order, my income in order, and uh, I did what's called house hacking. It's probably the easiest way to get into real estate um, where you can put as little as 3% down on a house. Um, especially right now and there's some other government, you know, rebates and loans coming out that you can get with no money down, you yeah. know, Biden pulls through. So house hacking, you live in the house that you rent out, right? And right. so I bought a townhome and I rented it out to five different people. I lived rent free for the next three, four years. So right? college roommates. College roommates, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can do the same thing with a duplex, right? Where you live in one half of it and rent out the other half of it. 
Um, because it's your first property, it's very low money down, okay? Um, take out a 30 year mortgage. Everybody says take out 15% or 15 year mortgage. Just take out the 30, get the lower payment down, lower interest rate. Um, and uh, at that point, I got into real estate to where my roommates were paying me. So, hmm. you know, that was a really good investment for me. And then by the time I was ready to move out, that was a rental property. Now I could show it as a rental property and I was able to buy my second property with my wife um, when we got married right out of college. So nice. bought, bought our second property there. Um, I ended up selling both those properties. I wish I would have just held on to them, right? I wish I would have just uh, understood the vision of cash flow. And so I've always just dabbled in it. A couple of years ago, I got into this mindset of owning 100 properties. Um, 100 rental properties. 100 no. rental properties. That's the goal. Okay. And I knew it was a big goal. And, you know, uh, got started right away. And this year, I set a goal at the beginning of the year to buy 12 properties. And we've already purchased 11 properties this year. So Since um, January? Since January. Yeah. And it's so April. Yeah. So I need to set that goal a little higher. Dang, we got to raise the standard here, guys. But it's about 11 to 12. Did again, it's just creating a plan. And a lot of times you don't know that the answer to that plan, but it's like, I'm gonna buy real estate or I'm gonna buy an apartment complex or I'm gonna buy 12 properties. And then I went to the guy I trust in real estate and I said, how's this possible? Right. And we put together a plan, right? I had the vision, I had the thought, and then we had to put together the plan. And so uh, real estate is now a passion of mine. Um, a ton of guys on here that are in my same industries are buying up Airbnbs, they're buying up single families, multifamilies. It's a big part of our culture. Um, a lot of times when we go out to dinner in our circle, when we're golfing, this is what we're talking about. We're talking right. about real estate. How do we buy properties? How do we get into this stuff? Build, build the cash flow, right? We're trying to get that cash flow up as high as possible. We're not getting rid of our jobs, right? We still yeah. have our income, our earned income. So we can take that real estate and instead of playing with that money or, or spending on cars, we're just rolling it into more real estate gotcha. you know, as much as possible. Yeah, so I got a question that came through um, that said, what about mortgage insurance? So obviously when you buy a rental property, you want it to cash flow, right? The question is, what about that extra expense in mortgage insurance if you only put three and a half percent down? Yeah, it's the cost you're gonna pay, but it's lower entry point so you can get more properties. A lot of people can't save up 20%, 25%, especially a college kid. You know, I was able to if I wanted to at that point, but it's hard. And so uh, your very first home, you can put down a low, low, lower payment and get that thing cash flowing as much as possible. I've gone the route of the Burr method. So if you guys follow me on TikTok, you'll see a lot about the Burr method where I'm actually buying my properties cash, mm. okay? Um, they're homes that need some TLC, right? Yeah. They need some fixer upper. Uh, after we, we repair them, we put some money into them to repair them, then we get a renter in them, okay? And then we go refinance them. We get them appraised. They appraise way more than what we you know, bought them for. Do a cash out refinance. Take your money out. Take your money out, cash flow it, put that money right back into another property. So Dope. the Burr method's been what we've been doing, um, buying out of state, Indianapolis, that kind of stuff. We can do a whole nother video on, on this. Okay, got another question coming in. If you wanna start asking some questions here, do you ever, did you ever have a mentor to teach you in the beginning? How did you learn how to do it? So who taught you to do real estate? Did you just figure it out on your own? Man, real estate was one I had to figure out on my own. I just, I knew I needed to buy a home. I knew that was the right thing to do. I heard people doing it, so yeah. I purchased one. Luckily, made a killer return on that sucker, right? I, I lived rent free while in college. Um, that rent paid for my second home, really. Me and my wife were living virtually rent free because we're cash flow on that first property. Yeah. Um, and so I knew it was just the right thing to do. The market went crazy, so I ended up selling both those properties and buying my next homes, right? Right. Um, never got aggressive at investing until uh, I sought out mentorship, right? I went after people that knew a ton about real estate. And I went to some realtors, I went to people that were investing in real estate, trying to figure out which route I wanted to go. Um, finally, I met a wholesaler that wholesales properties out in Indianapolis, Pennsylvania, Cincinnati, uh, in Ohio, and uh, I loved it. I flew out there, I saw it, I felt it. I saw the processor, uh, process, I saw the contractors, I saw mm. the, um, you know, the property managers. You know, I went through the whole process and I trusted the process and pulled the trigger on uh, doing the bird method. Sick, cool. Yeah. So here are some of my main takeaways from just listening to him talk about real estate. For one, I think you just need to start jumping into it, right? First though, you gotta have some money. So if you don't have some money to put down on something, you can't get a property. So you gotta get into some game, some vehicle to go make a bunch of money so you can keep dumping it into real estate. But on top of that, if you don't make the money and keep making the money, you can't keep buying the properties, right? Correct. So the only way he could go buy 11 properties 
is because he has increased his income year over year in his main vehicle to where he could do that, right? Um, so I'm gonna open it up, I think, unless you have anything else, to just questions if you wanna type them in. We've had a few questions come in, but if you have any additional questions before we wrap up, let's toss them in there real quick. Um, while the questions are coming in, I think that that's the other thing that I like to touch on is, you know, really you have to become a professional spender before you can become an investor, right? You have to learn to budget. You have to learn to be able to put money away, yeah. right? Um, I talk about this all the time to really get serious about investing. You need to be able to put away 40% of your income. Mm. A lot of people talk about 20%. 20% is just getting started, right? 20% yeah. is you better be putting away 20% to, so that you can invest someday, right? Um, you got to find a way to get to 40%. And usually the only way to get to 40% is if you get your income up, understand taxes, get your taxes down. That's the number one expense that most people pay is taxes. So you got to learn yeah. the tax game and learn how to get your taxes down. Then you got to start cash flowing. That's why I got into rental properties. You got to start building cash flow. That's just coming right back into the bank account. And then it's very easy to live um, 60% of your income, your taxes, your expenses, everything like that in 60%. So you can invest at least 40% of your income. And you got cash flow paying for a lot of your expenses. You get to right. uh, save more money along the way and, and stack it up a little bit more. Um, question that we had come through is who do we consider as a, as a, someone that's a role model or, you know, like another, another entrepreneur, who do you like? Man, there's so many resources on here. I like Chris Crone. If you're looking into real estate and that kind of stuff. I love Andy Frisella just because I love he he talks so straight. That's personal for me. Andy Frisella crushes it. I, He's prone for real estate. I like I like Grant Cardone. A lot of people Absolutely. don't like Grant Cardone. I can watch Grant all day long, um, that kind of stuff. So another question right there. Got a question coming in. Besides pitching and communication on the doors, what are good unconscious traits you see yourself using to maximize your efficiency? Great question. Um, that, that's a lot of the questions I've been coming in is sales stuff. So let, let's direct this to sales a little bit. Yeah. Um, I would say the number one factor to be successful in sales is not the product or service. Most product and services that you guys are offering are good. Customers want them, right? They're not buying the product or the company. They're buying you. And so the number one thing you have to learn how to do is make people like you immediately, right? You have the first 12 seconds introduction to make somebody like you and trust you and so you got to learn how to make a human connection with somebody so many times i see a young sales rep start selling right away mm -hmm. hey how you doing sir this is what i'm offering this is our product and service right and they're literally looking through your soul like when is he going to stop talking so i can tell him to go away right yeah, yeah. instead of Hey, how you doing, sir? By the way, I love the Star Wars shirt, right? You big Star Wars fan. Mandalorian. Yeah. yeah or connect on something. 49ers guy? Why is there a 49ers guy living in Texas, right? right. Like, you got to learn to small talk and make, compliment somebody, uh, make communication, small talk real quick. So eventually they'll be like, what is it that you're doing? They'll, they'll be curious about what you're doing because they like you and they trust you immediately. You're yeah. different than all the salespeople. That's at the introduction. And then I feel like there's a point of the sell in the middle of the home or wherever you're at in your, in, in your sales process. Uh, there's a part of the sell that you have to build a relationship of trust, right? And you, you literally have to take a minute of your time, sometimes 30 minutes of your time to find out more information of them about them yeah. and show sincere interest about them and their interests. Whatever's on the wall, they got a big fish, they got a hunting rack, whatever it is, let's talk about something that's interesting to them and find a way to, to show why you're interesting as well, right? So right. for me, every cell I get in, whatever we're talking about, I'm gonna tie it into my family. Hey, this is, and I'll show them a picture of my family, my kids, yeah. and I'm gonna show them why I'm interesting. And the psychology behind this is right now, this customer, you're already sitting at their table. They're listening to you. They're, they're deciding whether they trust you and like you. And literally the thought is coming across their mind. Do I want to put money in this kid's head pocket? Right? Yep. We, we all do the same thing. When you buy a car, you're literally okay with the car salesman making a commission off you because you like him and you trust him. You're like, I'm going to give this guy my commission. I'm okay with that. The but, opposite happens too. When you definitely don't like the car salesman, you definitely don't buy, you might even love the car but you're like, someone else has got to sell me this car. For sure, if you, especially if you don't trust the guy. So you got to spend a minute in your sales process, break it up and build that relationship of trust, right? Because you got to give them that reason to trust you and love you. 
um, so that you can ask for the business at the end of it. 100%. Guys, maybe let's do one more question coming in and then uh, we'll wrap it up. If you don't follow us, we've got, we're both live but not together. My Instagram is smootru, S-M-O-O-T-R-U. This is top one percenter if you're on mine, that's T-O-P-1. P-E-R-C-E-N-T-E-R, okay, go follow us. We're gonna do more of this. We're gonna just share like abundantly what we have learned in our lives. He's been crushing the game and so we're here, okay? Last ton, question. Ton, there's a lot of questions on here about my rental properties and sales and that kind of stuff. Uh, Cody just said it right here, 100,000 followers on TikTok, guys. Um, go to my TikTok, it's just top one percenter. There's no underscore. I was able to grab that one. Um, Everything real estate there, taxes on there, sales is on there, business is on there, you know, it's all on there. So if you can go on there and, and follow that, you can get a lot of these questions answered and get it in our DMs. If you guys wanna ask us questions about sales, um, you know, about uh, investing, real estate, Texas, whatever. Any of it. And we're being abundant, right? Not all of you work at Vivint, we know that, we realize that. If you don't work at Vivint, that's totally cool. We're not necessarily trying to recruit you. We might just be abundant and share with you too, okay? Yes, sir. So follow me on TikTok as well. You can find me on Mo Money, Mo Freedom on TikTok. I just got started, but you can go learn a little bit there as well, okay? Peace out, guys. See you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks.